serving Belfast, all the services that the Council or the Corporation provided for Belfast, then the second one about the building of the City Hall, or the building of the City Hall itself is linked with the services provided. Then I'm going to look at some events that took place uh, at the City Hall, and Ian's going to wrap it all up and leave all the difficult questions that I accumulated in people's minds, and he can answer them in the last session with the archives and nothing more. Today I'm looking at, at serving Belfast, looking at the functions that were provided by the Corporation, uh, as most people of a generation would call it, you know, uh, before next time three people referred it to the corporation, but rather than the council know this, the same thing effectively. Uh, the corporation dates back to, to 1613, uh, uh, when James I granted the charter to form a, a first corporation. Now his, his interests may not, James I's interests may not be very much at the forefront of his mind with what services he was going to provide to the citizens of Belfast or any other town that he granted a charter for, for that matter, more political, which I won't go into at the moment. Uh, but as a result of that corporation, which was given to the, the Chichester family, uh, Sir Arthur Chichester in the first sense, that corporation started to deliver a range of services, as did the other corporations as well, but they were very, very limited. And what I'm going to talk about today, I know the title says from 1613, you will find very quickly that the bulk of what I'm going to talk about is the 19th and 20th century. Because that's whenever corporations and councils started really to impact on people's lives. And rather than telling you what to do, they actually provided some services to help you do what they told you to do, as opposed to the differentiation. But very, very limited, but they did do, did do some things. And I'm going to give you a few examples, and it's very, very easy because essentially, the records of Belfast Corporation from 1613 to 1840 are in two books. There's a few other fragments, but essentially they're in two books. One called the Town Book and the other called the Assembly Book. And very helpfully, Robert McG uh, McGill Young in 1892 published one of them, the Town Book, uh, which the Council republished a few years ago. And just to give you an example of the sort of thing that the, the 1613 Corporation were doing, uh, they regulated markets, they cleaned streets, uh, and the kept law and order. That's a, a broad summary of what they're doing. And I want to give you a feel for that. Uh, and I think probably the best one to start off with is, is the cleaning of streets. Because by and large, that is what most people still to this day associate the corporation and council of. Uh, so this is from uh, 1663, um, when they passed the following uh, regulation. Uh, the tenants living in any house or houses or the unit or occupied a shop, cellar, warehouse, storehouse, or any place of ground, Fronting upon any of the streets or lanes of the four shades on, shall every week, twice, that is to say, on Wednesday and Saturday, sweep and make and clean or cause to be swept and made clean his or her portion of the street that belongs to such a house. So we're doing that type of thing, but you see very clearly the responsibility was on you to do it. Okay? Uh, maybe one that wouldn't spring maybe so easily to mind uh, is to do with chimneys. Uh, in 1638, another regulation was passed about wooden chimneys. That say that they, it is therefore thought fit and so ordered that said chimneys, that's wooden chimneys, shall be pulled down and brick chimneys shall instead be made upon forfeiture of every purse that makes the fault of saves some 40 shillings. So maybe you would say that's the beginning of planning law, or as our building control officers would like to say, the beginning of building control. Lighting the streets, of course, was a concern also, uh, and uh, in 16, uh, 1680, for example, in terms of lighting, we read, that lights in, uh, be hung uh, at every other house door window about the dark nights from the hours of 6 to 10 from the 29th of September to the 29th of March uh, following to give lights to the streets and lanes of the town for the benefit of the inhabitants and passengers to prevent disorders and mischief. Now they were passing lots of these regulations. They were passing regulations about when you take this subject close to my heart but when you could sell beer and when you couldn't sell beer. Uh, passing regulations of an early firefighting. But the onus was very much on the citizen that they would do what they were told and that they would provide the service. Um, but this 17th century uh, corporation and into the, the 18th, 18th century into the 1700s gradually wasn't doing very, very much. And it was seen that other bodies were starting to emerge, which I'm sure Ian will touch on in his talk, uh, during the 1700s, were starting to provide the services that you might expect a corporation or a council to provide. In 1752, the Belfast Charitable Society is established, which provides the, provides the first poor house at, at Clifton House. Uh, 1795, the Spring Water Commission is coming to be to start to provide clean water supply. 
1785, the ballast board, or the harbour office we would know it as today, is established to provide and improve the port and harbour. And what you start to see is that this corporation is not really functioning properly, it's not providing the service one. It was very much in the control of the Chichester family, and the Chichester family's fortunes were going up and down at this time. And in 1800, a new body is established, which in many ways was to replace the, 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 the old corporation as, as a sort of seen as a step on the way towards a council that we might recognize today. And that was called the police board. It was actually divided into two groups. We all think these terminologies like police board that we hear today and the news are all new terminology. We'll find the government everything goes around in circles and these names have all been used before as well. Uh, and their purpose was to pave clean light streets and a night watch. And we will look at some of those now as, as we go on the talk. Uh, and in the 1830s, there was a huge government inquiry into the powers of the old corporations and the police boards uh, to begin preparing a new form of municipal government in Ireland. And they conducted interviews, and so suppose we call them surveys nowadays. They were very formal interviews with people. And they concluded that Belfast Corporation had ceased to be an object of interest to the inhabitants. It's a very nice way for saying it wasn't doing very much. And in 1840, uh, the Irish Municipals Act is passed, and as a result of that, new town councils are established. Uh, one of them in Belfast. It's about at the beginnings of dem democratic government. The old Chichester government basically had to be a nominee of the Chichester Corporation, had to be a nominee of the Chichester family. But this one, at least, although it's a very high franchise or tight franchise, the start of a democratic government. Look, government. And it had initially a reluctance to extend its functions, and uh, I don't want to see the instant, but he's a fabulous quote that will exemplify that later on. But gradually, as Belfast grew in terms of its population, I uh, think in the second half of the 19th century, the services that they had to provide uh, expanded. There's great expansion of the services now that I'm going to look at uh, in some detail now in a moment. Uh, the other thing, of course, that I remember is the big change is that uh, prior to 1921, there is no Northern Ireland. So with Act of Partition and the Government Ireland Act 1920, and Partition 1921, and Northern Ireland was set up, and with that, uh, the Council takes on functions that we no longer have today, uh, things like elementary education, secondary education in 1923 and 47, for example, a massive wide range of health and welfare services post the Second World War, and then we came to the reform of local government in 1973, and as Ian alluded to, now we're starting to prepare for another reform of local government. You'll be very pleased to know that I'm not going to talk about the current reform of local government. The bulk of what I'm going to say is up until, up until 19th century. And what I propose to do is look through a range uh, of services, about a dozen services if I can, time for many, because any one of these services would basically uh, would justify a talk on their own. We just talked to Ian, I did a talk here recently on transport. You know what I'm half an hour on transport, same with course what I want to start with, which is gas. Because Belfast was one of the first towns in Ireland uh, to use gas or coal gas for lighting purposes. In 1821, two gentlemen from Leicester, uh, John and George Barlow, entered into an agreement with the police board. That's the board that was established in 18, uh, 1800 as a sort of replacement uh, for the old corporation to light the town with gas. And the construction of the gas works starts the following year, in 1822, uh, with the Marquis of Donegal who owned the land laying the foundation on the 15th of April 1822. It was a one and a half acre site and the first gas works on the site cost £40,000. And those of you who are familiar with maps of Belfast in the early 19th century will know that that part of Cromick and Cromick Wood was still quite rural at that time and that's where it was decided to build uh, the first gas works. And an Act of Parliament passed in May 1823 uh, obtained statutory powers for a private company, the Belfast Gas Light Company, to produce and distribute the coal glass. So in many ways, it was a private company who were providing it for the police board, part of the council as such as we would understand it today, but it would never have happened if the initiative hadn't been coming from the police board to have this. And on Saturday, the 30th of August, 1823, a large crowd uh, assembled to witness the first gas street lighting in Belfast. And if you have time, look up uh, the Belfast newsletter, for example, in the 1823, uh, the 30th of August, and there's a wonderful account of this switching on of this light in Belfast. I couldn't do it justice, so I suggest that you open it. So the corporation purchases the gas works. They got the statutory power set the private company to run it, but it was private company up to 1874. But the corporation, they purchase it uh, for the sum of £432,000. 
1874. So after that, they take it back under their under their control, and that in itself is quite interesting as, as we go on. We'll hopefully see that a lot of things started off in private hands and gradually came into the corporation. So there's an interesting sort of trend there. I hope that we'll see. And under the municipal control of the corporation, the, the gas techniques uh, um, are approved, uh, and the uh, two of the sort of leading lights in the management of the gas works in the middle of the 19th century and the, and the second half of the 19th century were a father and son team. Uh, James Bell Fox, who was manager of 1852 to 1875, and uh, his son, James L. Fox Jr., who was the manager from 1875 to 1907. Now, those of you who have heard Tell Doss, Tell Fox, the mountaineer, this is an ancestor of, of, of his. Now, uh, Ian and I were doing the project, we were greatly intrigued to see that this gentleman did a work tie. And we later found out as part of our research that he was totally objected to wearing a tie. He always wore uh, top buttons. So Ian and I sort of continued that, but I like wearing a tie and Ian doesn't. <laughs> so we, we continued that uh, ad hoc. Way. But that whole expansion uh, continues to improve. The Gasport buildings that I showed you a moment ago, they date from 1887. And some of the books you will see have read that the Stealth Fox is actually designed these buildings. Now, the Stealth Fox were responsible for an awful lot, but I think it's now agreed that the architect who designed these buildings of the 1880s, late 1880s, was designed by, designed by Robert Watt. So the gas was produced, as I say, from, from coal, uh, but in the 1960s, because of an attempt to reduce uh, production costs, they shifted to producing it from oil. And that saw a shift in where the gas was actually being produced, uh, with it moving to uh, to the Belfast Office Harbour Estate at, at, at Sydenham, where the two new plants were produced, uh, were, were producing the total uh, gas needed for the city uh, by April 19 by April 1968. Uh, by that time, at its peak, Belfast Gas Works was supplying 150,000 domestic, commercial, and, and industrial customers, not only in Belfast but in Hollywood. Carrick, Fergus, and Lisbon. But as you all know, I'm sure the oil crisis hits in 1973, and that had severe long term re repercussions. The oil prices, increased in oil prices, put up the, the gas price, and after a lot of deliberation, the council eventually closed the gas uh, works in Belfast in November 1998. The site now forms, uh, I suppose, a part of the first part of the, what was the regeneration of Belfast, that is still ongoing. But these are just a couple of images that I like to. Uh, show you know that, that many people haven't seen before uh, of the barges bringing the coal up into the River Blackstaff uh, with the gasometers uh, in the background. Uh, maybe some of you are not sure. Some of you may just remember the gas street lighters that were still around until uh, certainly the late 60s, maybe even the early, the very early 1970s. But gas was one form of uh, energy. It was very very uh, profitable for the council. You will read in lots of books that it was the profits from the gas works that built the City Hall. Employees of the gas works would have you believe it paid for all the building to City Hall. It, it didn't, but it paid for most of it. But the profits from the gas works also let, helped the corporation develop other services. And it's quite interesting that one of the services that they helped to fund in its early days was to turn out to be its rival, which in many ways absorbed it. Uh, and, that was, and that was electricity. Uh, one of the driving forces for the development of electricity. Uh, public supply of electricity by a corporation in Belfast was uh, Alderman W.J. Perry of the shipyard across here, uh, later Lord, Lord Perry. Uh, and the first electricity generation station opened by the corporation uh, was in Chapel Lane uh, in Belfast, uh, opened in, in 1895, uh, Chapel Lane Marcus Street. And from the archive, we were able to find out the very first customer to be connected was called Reuben Payne, who was a tailor uh, on two chitters. Street in Belfast, uh, just beside where the water, the, the, the Calendar Street, where the water between, between Marks and Spencer's uh, and that block of his coffee shop and where SS Moors is, this in that corner is a lovely little building with a clock turret. That was the first building to have a to be connected to the corporation electricity supply. The popularity of electricity was grew very, very quickly, um, and by 1897, a couple of years just after the Chapel Lane went open, there was already plans to build a much bigger power station uh, and in 1898 uh, East Bridge Street power station was opened on the 18th of October 1898 and so the talk. It's very interesting that was exactly the same day that the foundation stone was laid by the Lord Lieutenant 
for the opening to start the Dublin City Hall. The Lord Lieutenant will lay the foundation stone on the morning of the 18th of October 1898. They had five months, I think, from memory of the Ulster Hall. Uh, and then in the afternoon, he opened the brand new uh, East Bridge Street Power Station. Uh, coming up to the First World War, there were much debate uh, about a much bigger power station being needed. But even this one couldn't keep up the capacity. This power station was uh, associated with the next topic I'm going to touch on with transport, providing electric power for the electric trams. Uh, but more and more demand for electricity. Uh, and just before the war, there was talk about building one here on the Harbour Estate. And the war uh, and cut back gap of expenditure uh, delayed that. Uh, but in 1917, the decision was taken to proceed. Uh, and work commenced in 1919 in opening the Harbour Power Station, and it opened on the 15th of August 1923. Now, along after the war, particularly in the interwar years, the corporation was very quick uh, to demonstrate to potential customers what the benefits of electricity were, and particularly what the benefits were in the home. And they held various road shows, I suppose we would call them now, uh, like this. This is in the, a lot of people think it's the City Hall, but it's actually in the tech in Belfast, where they just it was similar steam plan ones, wonders of some art picker, demonstrated uh, their their wares, I suppose, for a want of a better word, like modern electric coopers, which could, coopers which could be rented. You didn't have to purchase it off to uh, uh, rent it or you know, hire purchase. Uh, and in 1928, they advertised the first all electric house uh, that was sold. It was in Balfour Avenue, and that was the first house that all the furnishings were electric. Uh, Again, couldn't keep up with supply, and in 1951, uh, there was a beginning of a campaign to build a second power station here in the Harbour Estate. And the date there is 1955, I see it, but that's the, the date that they started uh, building it, 6th of May 1955, they started building it, and it was completed in 1961. But the days of gas uh, came to an end, I suppose, on the corporation control, and as you will see with a lot of these topics, it's a very similar pattern, similarly with electricity. Uh, and in 1973, with that reform of local government, the corporation electricity department is, uh, is closed down and it's absorbed into the newly established that it was then known as the non named electricity service. Uh, it's now for NAE and Viridian. So these things, these things move on. But electric and electric power is very closely associated uh, with the next talk I want to look quickly at. Uh, transport, uh, you know, the rapid expansion of Belfast population, the rapid expansion of the suburbs where people uh, wanted to live, uh, you know, created a need for an efficient method of public transport. Uh, in 1872, a private company, Belfast Street Tramway Company, started a horse tram system uh, in, in Belfast, and they rapidly you know, expanded uh, across the city. But the, the private company, again, you know, was very much working in league uh, with the corporation uh, and the corporation had a clause that they could buy out the private company uh, and in 1905 they did buy out the private company and from 1905 the, the tramway system was operated by the corporation but they made a very significant change to it within the space of a year starting in January 1905 and that date at the bottom is wrong and I always forget to change it um, they, uh, they electrified and enlarge the entire system. And this is a photograph of them laying tracks at the junction of York Street, Royal Avenue, uh, and Donegal Street at the, at the end of 1905. Uh, and so, you know, immediately the new power station at East Bridge Street was providing basically the power for this electric uh, tram system, which marked a, a big uh, change in how transport was provided. The corporation paid. Uh, just over £371,000 for the purchase of the uh, horse tramway system and it cost in order just over another £600,000 to electrify the system. So huge amounts of money in those times. Um, by 1929 there were 341 tram tracks running across the city, over 100 miles of tracks. This is a, a photograph of the Lord Mayor uh, Dixon at the time. In 1905, in November 1905, the sort of the inauguration of the electric trams, uh, nicely decorated up. I think the advertising signs are nearly everything with the trams, so I hope there's no tram buffs in here. I find the advertising signs particularly, particularly it's a, The as one of the things I'll touch on the way through is that some of the individuals, you know, who really were responsible for making things happen within the corporation, 
Uh, the prey was a big driving force behind electricity. The stealth foxes behind gas. Stealth foxes are English. Uh, Perry's English. Uh, and this man, Andrew Nance, came from Portsmouth. And he had worked for the private company, the Belfast Street Tramways Company. Remember the corporation buys it over, he was the general manager. When they buy it over, he comes over into the corporation to be the general manager of the corporation system. An absolutely formidable character. He, of course, could travel free in the trams. So he sat up on the top of the tram, smoked his pipe, and made his wife sit down uh, <laughs> and the floor below. Uh, but he was also a, he was a great businessman. That's what, why, he was, why he was really brought in. But well, he was a formidable man to work with. And this is from the Register of Drivers uh, in 1893. And as you would imagine, he dismissed quite a few of them. Some of them had a very short span. These ones here, most of them only ever worked for the firm for less than a year. Uh, now, as you'd expect, anybody that was caught with drink, he dismissed them. You could have sort of expect that. But there's other records where he dismissed you even if he saw you come out of a public house, even if you were off duty. He still dismissed you. But a lot of comments up here, you know, about left without notice and uh, dismissed for impertinence. Uh, uh, there's another very, uh, very good one. Yeah, left car unattended, a uh, good riddance. So he may have some difficulty with modern employment law, but he certainly he certainly knew how to run a very efficient business in his time, and he did. He did a very um, public. Now, the trams uh, eventually uh, faced a lot of competition from buses. Uh, the corporation itself started uh, with their own buses in October 1926. But basically the corporation had a monopoly of buses working within the city. But the Minister for Home Affairs changed the law in 1927, whereby it, uh, the, they couldn't do that. And private bus operators began to operate within the city from country areas. And as a result, there was a uh, competition, which is really referred to as the Belfast Bus War, between the Belfast Tram Company and the private bus operators. But within the space of a year, that had been resolved, and Belfast Corporation got its monopoly back, uh, so that private operators couldn't run buses within the city. And that largely has continued, you could maybe say, to the present day, but certainly up on until the 1970s. But the real opposition that the trams themselves faced was, in 1938, it was decided to get rid of the trams and to replace them with trolley buses. But it took much longer to get rid of trams and replace them with trolley buses that they thought, partly as a result of the Second World War, of course, and the shortage of you know, parts and machinery. Uh, and the last tram ran in February 1954. There was a big procession uh, through Belfast of the last trams, and this is them arriving at the Argoin Depot in, 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 19, in 1954. As I say, they were replaced by trolley buses, but trolley buses themselves uh, 1959, the decision was taken to replace the trolley buses with diesel buses. Uh, and the corporation, um, from 1968 on, only ran diesel buses. And then, largely as a result of, and just doing some work on this recently, as a, uh, as a sort of a side effect of the troubles, uh, the corporation loses the monopoly of transport, and the transport is passed over to City Bus, but effectively it's Austro Bus. City Bus was a, a trade name that Austro Bus operated under. Uh, and now we know it does the thing metro buses. So again, corporation Papin again loses uh, control of transport in 1973. <coughs> Turning to a completely different thing, uh, Belfast from its foundation was very much a centre of, of trade and a marketplace. Uh, and of course the market rights had also been given to uh, Sir Arthur Chichester and his, and his successors, the Marquis of Donegal. And they kept them until 1847, when the newly established town council that met for the first time in 1842, they purchased the existing, the existing market rights. The new corporation reclaims land on what we would know as Oxford Street and East Bridge Street, and they, they establish new markets there for the sale of cattle, sheep, fish, vegetables. And I suppose the one that's, most, that's still there that we all can associate with is St George's Market, uh, which was built between 1890 and 1896 for the sale of butter and eggs and fruit, very much a variety market I suppose. Uh, and then the other market that we're all uh, feeling, some, I think we all feel some degree of, uh, I'm not sure what the right word is, but some degree of closeness or fondness for uh, is Smithfield Market, which also uh, was developed uh, by, by, by the corporation. I suppose there's still a little bit of it left, but no, nowhere near what a lot of us would remember what it did look like. I suppose the other side of markets is, uh, it's just a couple of shots of Smithfield Market, the other side of markets is, is abattoirs. Um, abattoirs are closely associated with public health, but we don't think of it that way now. 
but certainly in the 19th century they did. Uh, and the first public abattoir was opened uh, in 1869 in Macaulay Street. Prior to that, butchers did their own killing, uh, butchery on the street, essentially, which was a public health hazard. Uh, and as you know, greater awareness of public health develops and this organisation you know, pushes that awareness, uh, in 1869, a delegation of city councillors uh, took themselves off to look at abattoirs throughout Europe, including Paris. I'm not going to say anything, I'll leave that to your imaginations. Uh, and they uh, came back with a recommendation that this new abattoir should be opened. And it operated in the College Street from 1869, it was a great advance at its time. And the method itself was replaced by a new abattoir at Church Street in the market area in 1913. And one of the great advocates of all this public health, particularly to do with markets in the abattoir, was a gentleman that requires a lot of research, I think, if somebody has to him, called Dr. Henry O'Neill, who was chairman of the Markets Committee and a leading public health campaigner uh, in the second half of the 19th century. Stuart Street Abattoir was replaced itself in 1970 by the city of Belfast Meat Plant that done crew, but I don't want to say anything about it because the last time I was there I fell off a ladder and hurt my back. <laughs> this before it was sold, so I don't have very happy memories of it at all. Maybe one of the things that we don't associate the council with uh, nowadays is policing. Um, but between 1860 and 1865, uh, the, the corporation uh, had its own town police force. They were nicknamed the Bulkies, which of course is an awkward nickname because the harbour police are quite often called that as well. Uh, and they are a separate uh, organisation. But I suppose the clue within the name of the police board. Uh, initially it was only a night watch system, they only operated at night. Uh, when they were established first in, in 1816. But by October 1817, they were starting to provide around the clock uh, policing service. And there's been a very good book written on uh, this Belfast Town Police by Brian Griffith. But I think the best known member of the Town Police uh, is this gentleman here, Captain Air Mars Abassi Shaw, who commanded both the Belfast Police Force and the Belfast Fire Brigade, which I'm going to come to in a second, uh, for a very short time, it has to be said, from June. Uh, 1860 to August 1861. But the reason why I'm saying he's the most famous member is, is that he left Belfast to become superintendent of the London Fire Brigade. And while he was there, he was immortalised by Gilbert and Sullivan in the upper operata Isle, Isle of Anthe. So this is somebody famous directly connected with Belfast and directly connected. Now after 1864, the very serious riots in Belfast in 1864 were sectarian in nature. Uh, and the police force was seen to have taken shown favouritism uh, and it was disbanded and replaced by the Irish Constabulary on the 1st of September 1865 which itself later became known as the Royal Irish Constabulary. I mentioned that Shaw was also the commander of the Fire Brigade. Uh, in 1845 um, there was a major improvement act passed for Belfast and as part of that Belfast Corporation were given the powers to recruit and equip a professional Fire Brigade. I can read out an extract from 1660 where they're telling the householders and the business people in Belfast that it's your responsibility to provide a ladder and a leather bucket and all this. But that starts to change in the 19th century after 1885 and a professional fire brigade uh, begins uh, in the late uh, second half of the 19th century. Some of you I'm sure will remember the big fire station in Chichester Street, this photograph here, uh, and it was opened in 1894. It was a model for fire stations at the time and many other corporations too, the British Isles copied it. Uh, by 1905, a further four fire stations had been built on the Albert Bridge Road, Shankill, Ardoyne and Wattler Street, but this was, the, this was the main one. And Belfast Fire Brigade was very, very forward thinking. Uh, in 1893, they were the first fire brigade to introduce uh, an ambulance service. If you go to Dublin to this day, you will see uh, the, uh, the ambulances with Dublin Fire Brigade on it but the, the, the run was part of the same service, but that actually started in Belfast, so Belfast was the first place to British Isles to do that in 1883. And by 1910, they were the first fire brigade in British Isles to be completely motorised. They had been rid of all the old horse-drawn fire uh, appliances, and by 1911, they had the first one. There's a photograph taken about the thing between 1928 and 1929. Of course, the fire brigade stations were redeveloped um, in the second half of the 20th century with Lisbon Road opened in 1954, Knox Station replacing the Albert Bridge one and a new Whitley Street fire station. But again the corporation loses uh, responsibility for the fire brigade and on 1st October 1973 it transfers to the newly established uh, fire authority. 
this again, just a couple of shots here to see some photographs of, of the fire brigade operating their ambulances. And then that leads into ARP training. I'm not going to say very much about this, other than that uh, in the lead up to uh, the Second World War, in 1938, local authorities were made responsible for the provision of uh, air raid precaution services and Belfast Corporation formed the ARP committee. Uh, by 1941, there were 8,500 air raid uh, and 1,600 auxiliary fire service. And during the war, particularly during the Blitz in Belfast in April, May 1941, those 33 civil defence workers killed and their names are recorded in a plaque uh, in the city of Alton. It just ties in a bit with the fire brigade, but it's more to do with uh, just events during the war itself. Turning maybe to a, a more cheery subject, uh, I think we all associate our uh, councils with parks. Um, in 1869, the first legislation was passed in Parliament uh, allowing the corporations or councils to create public parks. Uh, and in that year, the corporation published the, the land from Lord Donegal at Ormo uh, to create a park, and they also purchased some land which was the ground that became the first city cemetery, the Falls Road, to set aside for a park. Uh, parks are very much associated with public health. I think now we see it as leisure and recreation, uh, but in the 19th century, it's very much part of this clean air move, people getting out into the air, and very closely associated with public health. And, and Ormo Park was the first public park to be established. It was opened on the 15th of April uh, 1871. It was quickly followed by Falls Park in 1873. Uh, Alexandra, Woodville, Dudville and Victoria were all opened by 1895. And in that year also, the corporation buys over Botanic Gardens. So Botanic Gardens was originally owned by a private company. Uh, and the corporation take it over in 1895 for the sum of £10,500. Uh, this nice green photograph of people uh, by the Palm House. Of course, the expansion of parks continues. Um, when I was talking about trams, I didn't mention that the corporation took over another tramway company that used to run on the Antrim Road, Cave Hill to Whitewell Tramway, in, in 1910. And as part of that uh, purchase, they, they bought quite a lot of land on what we now know of as, as Bellevue. Uh, and that was the beginning of Bellevue, and then, of course, the zoo is opened there in 1934. But it's interesting that that development wasn't run by the Parks Department until the late 60s. It stayed in the control uh, of the Transport Department. There was quite a lot of rivalry as to who would have this duel. Would it be the Transport or would it be the, the uh, would it be Parks themselves? Uh, some of you maybe remember the Floral Hall in full swing. Uh, and it was opened in, in 1936. In 1934, uh, Belfast Castle was given to the corporation by the 9th Earl of Shaftesbury. It wasn't quite just as generous as that. There was a bit of a clause about paying for land that housing was going to be built on. But the grounds of the castle were gifted to the city in 1930 and 1934. Uh, cemeteries, with a growing population and organisation, the need for municipal cemeteries uh, became to the forefront and it was in the mid 19th century the other graveyards in the city just simply couldn't cope. Uh, and the first municipal cemetery was coming to a surprise was the city cemetery in Falls Road. And it opened on the 1st of August 1869. And this is actually a record in order for burial for the first burial in the city cemetery. A little child, Samuel Tate, will be the 8th Hercules Street. And sadly, the little boy was only one year, four months old. First burial uh, in the city cemetery. The Dundonald Cemetery, which was still run by the council, was opened in 1905, again because of the, you know, the need for more burial space. And Roselawn Cemetery was opened in 1954. And of course, that's also the site of the crematorium. Uh, the crematorium was opened in 1961, and it was the first crematorium of its kind anywhere in the end of Ireland. I can't emphasize, as I've gone on about, how a lot of these developments were associated with, with public health. I suppose that the one that is most associated with, with public health uh, are the wash houses. Most houses, the vast, vast majority of houses in the 19th century lacked running water and public wash houses were necessary for the people. Uh, and the first public uh, corporation public bath is pictured here at Peter's Hill, this is 1931, but it was opened in, in 1880. And it was very quickly followed by one on Ormo Avenue in 1889 one on Templemore Avenue in 1893, and the Falls Road one in 1896. Now these institutions also have swimming ponds, 
And that really is a start to we started to see them also being used for a recreational purpose. And I suppose in some respects that was the direction that, that they went in the later 20th century. But when they were initially built, recreation was not foremost in people's minds. It was, I was very definitely, public health. Belfast also had a large, you know, large industrial city, had a lot of single men, a lot of these men were living in common lodging houses. Uh, and you know, they were potential has health hazards. And from 1845, the corporation had legal power to go in and inspect these common lodging houses to see uh, what sort of health conditions were in them and inspect them generally. But in 1902, at Carrie House was opened, which was a purpose-built uh, accommodation, it was basically accommodation for these working men, uh, men in the city. You know, when, you, when you look at it, it looks very there, it looks a bit like a reception in a cafe or the desk in a cafe, but these were built for the basic uh, accommodation accommodation for men. And then after the Second World War, you know, uh, sorry, I'm just going on too quick, sorry. Uh, I mentioned, sorry, earlier, that cleansing is one of the very, street cleaning is one of the very uh, earliest services provided by the, the, the corporations and the council. Now, the earliest record I can find, and our cleansing colleagues are always very keen that I find a record to cleansing as the oldest council service. Uh, and the earliest one I could find is 1660, 1663. But as I, as I read that actually I started, that was very much the onus was on the citizen to go out and approach their bit of, their, their bit of the street. But from uh, the middle of the, the 19th century, the corporation was employing what they call scavengers to remove rubbish from the street. Um, particularly from 1840, from 1845 on, and they continue to provide that service and it's developed. And this was a, a photograph that a, a, a colleague in the in the corporation or the council found of the cleansing department at Short Strand in 19 in 1938. Uh, after the Second World War, uh, that's the modern day photograph. They're always very keen that you that you include a modern one. Uh, I suppose one thing I should let me say is that it's with public health that you start to see the first woman being employed by the council. Uh, this is a photograph taken in 1906, uh, and there's two ladies in this photograph here and here. But there's actually another photograph that's not as good a quality for reproduction, and that's why they need. There's actually three ladies, and these ladies were employed as executive sanitary officers uh, doing inspections to uh, see what sanitary conditions were like. A lot of emphasis on clean milk and all this type of thing coming into the city, uh, and that's the, the beginnings, the beginnings, the beginnings of that. Uh, and Infectious diseases were rife in the city uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the 19th century, you know, cholera, typhoid and tuberculosis in, in, in particular. And the first uh, medical superintendent of health was appointed in 1880. And I suppose what the big driving force behind all this was, and actually I would go further, what the big driving force behind the expansion of local government was, was the passing of the 1878 Public Health Act in Ireland. That's what really gave it the, the, the big expansion into people's an impact uh, on people's lives. And Samuel Brown, who'd been a former mayor, uh, but had been a naval doctor, he became the first medical superintendent of health in, in 1880. But tuberculosis, of course, uh, had a major effect on the lives of people in, in Ireland and Belfast in particular, and was a particular scourge. In 1913, the corporation formed a, a tuberculosis committee. Uh, and it took over the sanitarium at White Abbey in the following year, 1914, and they opened the Central Tuberculosis Institute in Durham Street in 1918. But they also opened an open air school because the whole idea at that time was that open air and fresh air was the best way to cure tuberculosis at Greymount. They opened a hospital uh, in 1921. And this is a photograph of a, a, a teacher uh, with the children who were suffering from tuberculosis getting their education uh, out, out in the fresh air. Turning to mental health, uh, Portiesborn um, Mental Hospital was opened by the corporation in 1903. And while you know, all these places have carried a certain stigma, uh, it has to be said that Portiesborn Mental Hospital was developed on a principle known as the Villa Colony. And when you compare it with what mental institutions were in the 19th, early 19th century, mid 19th century, certainly these detached residential units spread out over a large area rather than one big barrack of an institution uh, uh, were a great advance on the asylums of, of the 19th century. 
After the war, all this continues, and here we have, we have a photograph of polio vaccinations. I'm sure I, I certainly can remember the day I got my vaccination for polio. I'm sure many of you can as well. Uh, of these lunchtime sort of polio uh, uh, vaccinations. During the 19th century, I think a lot of the modern city, city centre of Belfast begins to take shape. Uh, when the town council was established in the 1840s, they start to fill in all the old docks along the River Lagan, and that's when Victoria Street uh, and Corporation Street begin to get laid out. Uh, then later on, in the 1880s, Hercules Street is cleared away, and Royal Avenue is built as, as a new street show, is shown here with very much, you know, a very clear, consistent planning uh, system being applied. Uh, the River Blackstaff, which was to refer to the 19th century as a smelly nuisance was covered over uh, and uh, Orwell Avenue was constructed as well at the same time. Uh, a problem in Belfast and it remains a problem of course is flooding and also there was a problem frankly, which was more or less all to do with sewage, those two things are connected. Uh, and in 1888, prior to then you know, there was basically the sewer was just discharged into the nearest stream and ultimately made their way into the lagging. But in 1888, a new work on a new sewage system began. Uh, and it was the responsibility of the city surveyor, a gentleman from Nottingham, called J.C. Bretland. The text that was just a, a cartoon, a cartoonist having a bit of fun with his name. But Bretland introduces a new sewage scheme. But as this cartoon shows, and we all know, flooding remains a problem in Belfast City Centre. Uh, basically, a few years after he completed uh, the project, this cartoon appeared in a tutorial magazine called No Bad's Weekly, uh, showing poor old Bretland uh, standing up to his knees in, in flood water, but it was still very, very much a problem. Uh, housing, we kept to touch on. Um, the corporation's record of housing is, is not great, it has to be said, I think. Um, it started off quite well. Uh, uh, particularly the latter part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, you know, they were responsible for clearing away under the oh, improvement over 1910 uh, a, lot of, a lot of slums. And one of the great side effects, benefits of this program was that they employed Paul, the photographer, to go around and take photographs of the slums that they were going to clear away. So we, uh, as a result, uh, we have a great collection of photographs of streets in, in Belfast that were, where the houses were, were programmed for, for, for taking away, the slums were programmed for being taken down. So that was one of the benefits of it. Uh, and in the period up to the end of the First World War, the corporation's record in housing isn't too bad. But depending on who writes the history, if you read the one account of say between the end of the First World War and the beginning of the Second World War, the corporation built 2,562 houses and it'll leave it like that. And that sounds like, oh yes, they were building houses. But really, for the expansion of Belfast at that time, the population of Belfast at that time, the, that was nowhere. That was nowhere near enough houses. Now, the, one of the one of the houses that were built at that time is Woodfield Estate. Uh, that's from about date from 1929. But really, the big boom in housing comes uh, after the Second World War, when approximately 13 houses are built uh, after the war, including Ballymurphy, Highfield, Tuckmona, all the big estates, and I'm sure you can name off. But Powers of housing were taken from the council in 1972 uh, and passed over to the, the, housing, the housing executive. My favourite building in Belfast, even though I work in City Hall and I'm very fond of it, is the Tech in Belfast. Uh, um, it again was also under, under the responsibility of the corporation. Uh, in 1900, the corporation was empowered to provide technical education for Belfast and more or less immediately they set about building uh, the Municipal Technical Institute, to give it its name at the time, uh, which most people call refer to as the College of Technology or just the Tech. Uh, the main purpose of this was opened in 1907. It could have been opened, the official opening was in 1907. It could have been opened slightly earlier, but the City Hall was opened in 1906, and I suspect, uh, though it's not written down, that they didn't want anywhere to steal the thunder of the opening of the City Hall. Uh, maybe they just held it back a few months. The first principal was a man called uh, Francis Charles IV. Uh, Otto Jaff, the only ever Jewish art mayor in Belfast, persuaded IV uh, to come across from the Manchester School of Technology to be the first principal uh, of this new municipal college of technology. 
Its purpose, I think, is very important. Its purpose was to trade workers for local industry uh, and commerce, and it was very close links built, built up uh, with, with, the local, with the local companies. Uh, gradually, it started doing courses in conjunction with Queen's University, uh, and after the Second World War, in particular, technical education in Belfast expands with the development of the Millfield site and opened in 1962, Rupert Stanley College itself in 1965, a college for domestic science at Garneville in 1962, and a college for business studies in the city centre at Bagel Media Street uh, in 1971. But I, I just particularly like this building, uh, although a lot of architectural stories have written some dreadful things about it, but I think that's largely because of the building it stands, it stands beside uh, being in. Um, it also uh, became uh, the home of the, the first uh, public art college in Belfast. Uh, the first government school of art, the first arts college in Belfast, I suppose, opens in 1849. Uh, whenever the, the tech, to call that, just opens in 1907, it moves into this building here. Uh, some very famous uh, and prominent artists went there, William Connor, Effie McWilliam, the sculptor, and, and John Luke, who of course painted the the mural in 1951 as part of the Festival of Britain. Of course, the, the College of Art later moved to the, the, the University, now the University of Ulster forms part of the complex uh, in the University of Ulster uh, across the way. How am I doing for time? Too bad. Uh, as well as technical education, with the establishment of Northern Ireland in 1921, um, the corporation takes responsibility for elementary education in uh, primary schools. Uh, and the first problem really that they faced uh, was the deplorable state of schools in Belfast. There had been a survey done of schools in Belfast just before the First World War and they basically come to the conclusion that they were in an appalling state. Uh, and taken, they become the Belfast Education Authority to give them their, 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 correct, their correct name, but it's under the auspices of, of the corporation. Uh, they appointed a, a, an architect from England, a Mr. R.S. Walsher, uh, and between 1926 and 1939, 26 new primary schools were built, and this is one of them, Park Parade, uh, on the Raven, on the Raven Hill Road. Nearly all these schools were identifiable, they're very much in this, in this style, they're, and they won many prizes, the architect won many prizes for the design of, the, of, of these schools. After the war in 1947, the corporation then assumes responsibility for secondary education as well. Uh, you know, children were expected to go on after the Second World War II to 14 uh, with you know, the selection and test introduced at 11 years of age. And between uh, 1947 and 1967, the corporation built three grammar schools and 16 secondary schools or intermediate schools they were, called, they were called at the time. So the other thing that's often overlooked is they also played a significant role in the development of nursery education. And I suppose the particular example in that is the Fleming Fulton School. <coughs> this is, uh, Near the end, now you'll be glad to hear. Uh, a couple of other things I just want to touch on briefly. Um, <coughs> libraries. Um, the first uh, municipal library in Belfast was opened in Royal Avenue. We know the Central Library uh, in 1888. Uh, it was opened just by the corporation, uh, which is interestingly <coughs> the same year Belfast becomes a city. Uh, it had taken a lengthy campaign to persuade the city fathers that there was a need for a library, and indeed there was a local referendum of ratepayers. Uh, and I think looking through some of the stuff whenever the library was actually opened. Uh, there seemed to be they spent so much money on the book between a few books, I think, maybe in the library, and the building was used for quite a lot of other uh, other functions. But gradually gradually that changed. And, and even to an extent that they very quickly start to see the need for, for branch libraries. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and they, they started off with like local reading rooms and then the first branch library was opened at Templemore Avenue in 1903. Uh, and of course, the library stock was greatly added to by thanks to the generosity of uh, Andrew Carnegie, uh, who financed the building of Old Park and Falls Library, which I hope is there, yeah, Falls Library and Donegal Road between 1907 and 1909. Uh, by 1973, there were nine branch libraries and two mobile libraries operating across the city, but again in 1973, corporation lose responsibility for it, and we see that, that passing over onto Belfast Education uh, and Library Board. Uh, the library uh, in Central Avenue uh, also was the first space for, well, it wasn't the first space, the museum. Uh, uh, the first two floors were, were developed as a museum uh, 
whenever the new library was opened in 1888, the collection of the Reverend John Granger in particular, which had been presented to the city, were stored there in the Belfast National History Society transferred a lot of their collections there. And they remained there until the 1920s. Now just before the war there had been a campaign to build uh, a Belfast Museum and Art Gallery. Uh, the war delayed that, uh, and it wasn't until 1929 that the Belfast Museum and Art Gallery that we know as the, as the Ulster Museum uh, was opened. But again, corporation lose responsibility for that. That comes a bit earlier. Uh, there's whose responsibility for that in 1962 when it's renamed, uh, renamed the Ulster Museum. This is a, a picture of the Ulster Hall, 1862. Uh, it was drawn by the architect uh, William J. Barry, the bar, William J. Barr from Newry. Uh, and again, the Ulster Hall, the point I want to make here is we really associated with the corporation, the council. But again, it was developed by a private company. Uh, we associated with big public meetings and sporting events and concerts, but largely it was built as a music hall. Uh, opened in 1862, a private company and the corporation purchased it in 1902 for the sum of £13,500. Uh, of course, a lot of us associated with those big events that I've named, political things, sporting events, but also it's very closely associated with the group theatre, which sadly it, it is no longer there, but it's where many of our best known actors, Jimmy Ellis, Stu Tomaldi, Elizabeth Bailey, all, 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 launched their, all launched their careers. Uh, I suppose it also starts to make us think about how people use their recreational time. And at the minute there's a big debate about the councils providing leisure services. Uh, and the first indoor accommodation for, for, for what they call physical recreation in those days was a gymnasium in Victoria Barracks in Belfast, uh, which the corporation took over in 1958 and they restored it like a gym, etc., and handed over for the Central Council of, of Physical Recreation. But it wasn't until 1972 that the corporation built its first purpose built leisure centre, and that was Maysfield, which is now closed, but the council still continues to provide uh, leisure recreation centres across the city. And tying in nicely with recreation, leisure and entertainment, I suppose the big development in recent times was the opening of the Waterfront Hall uh, in January 1997. I think I'm just about on time, and I'm happy to take some questions.